Good evening. Good to see you guys this, this evening. Hope you guys have been loved on on the way in. That's always our hope. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew. We're going we're gonna to change course just tonight. If you can cha uh, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Really, it's really cool because uh, I, I changed uh, the, the message for tonight. And, and uh, Jeremiah and the youth told me, uh, hey, man, we're doing a special message in the youth. And uh, it was the same message. And I thought, you know, only by the Spirit of God does that happen because we hadn't talked to each other at all. And uh, I showed up with it, with this today because I, were, I started on it earlier because I just thought this is what the Lord planted on my heart. So uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, remember uh, the, the conference this weekend. Men, uh, we'll be heading out that way. And uh, we got a pretty good group going. If you want to go, it's not too late. There's no charge, uh, so they welcome you over there if you want to go uh, there to Las Cruces. Love to have you. Um, we'll be there at Three Crosses. It's, but, but it's uh, their conference, but it's at a different place, just to give you a heads up. You can pick up a flyer out there, and you can, you can see, um, you can get the, the address of where we're going. Uh, one, more, one more thing I just wanted, well, two more things. Uh, Sunday we're going to do communion. If you want to break bread with us, make sure and make it here on that day. And then the other thing is the ARC tour. Uh, we've mentioned this a couple of times, but we're getting down to the wire on this thing. If you want to go with us, uh, we, need your, we need your commitment on this uh, as we put the final touches on this. And so uh, remember, it's uh, in 2025, April 7th through the 11th. Um, we're going to have a meeting on Wednesday, September 25th. And then uh, another one on Sunday, September 29th. So if you've been contemplating going, man, I, I'd encourage you to go. It was a really good trip. Love to have you with us as, as, we, as we head that way. Uh, I, I believe we're going to be able to keep it under 1500 bucks, um, which is a really good deal. But they can't give us the solid uh, price till, till we uh, find, finish it off. But uh, if you want to go with us, man, sign up. Uh, let's go. It'll be Monday through Friday. Uh, Monday traveling, Friday traveling, and then uh, Tuesday we'll be at the Creation Museum. Wednesday we'll be at the Ark. Thursday we got we got something in the morning I forget, and then we and then Thursday afternoon I think it's uh, uh, a boat ride uh, on the on the river there. Really cool. We did that last year. It was a really cool trip. So if you want to join us, we'd love to have you. Um, stop at the front desk or get hooked up, and uh, let's do, let's do it. Let's pray as we open up. Father, we do come before you. Lord, we, we lift up uh, this time to you, Lord. I, I pray that you would uh, continue to meet us here, Father, and uh, even, even today. Lord, I pray that, um, that you would speak to our hearts. Father, as we, as we look forward and, and uh, so many things clutter our minds and take our thoughts out, Lord, I pray that you would uh, be able to uh, move us in the direction you would want us to go and Lord, that we would not be merely hearers, but doers. So, Father, we lift this time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I, I, I found this, uh, it kind of relates with what we're doing, man. You, you know you're having a bad day when your boss tells you not to bother to take off your coat. You, you know you're having a bad day when your doctor tells you that you're allergic to chocolate. Yeah, that's a bad day. You know you're having a bad day when you finally remember the name of that person you promised to visit in the hospital while you read his name in the obituaries. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a bad, that's a bad day. You know you're having a bad day when you're informed that your youth group used steel wool sponges for their car wash. Yeah, yeah, just a few of them. There could probably be a whole bunch. But um, there are many things that can ruin our day. No doubt. And, and sometimes we spend our time worrying about those things. Um, but, but at times, it's the worry alone that's ruining our day. Because the situation that we're worrying about never comes to pass. Because worry means what if. That's what it means, what if. But it, it's not, it really isn't, hasn't um, happened yet. Who worried? about something, let's say, the last couple of weeks. Raise up your hand. See, every, all of you. I mean, every, everybody. We, have, we all worry about stuff. 
Uh, we worry about our country. We worry about the election. We worry about our children. We worry about grandchildren. In, in my family, we have a lot, lot of things going on that cause worry. Uh, family sicknesses cause worry. Within our church, we, we've also had a lot going on from illness to ministry. Uh, worry seems to be very much a part of our life. As a pastor, I'm given many things to worry about because I'm also a husband, a father, and a grandfather. There's never a shortage of worry topics in my life or, or in the church for sure. I worry about my own life, my own family, and living in a crazy world that we're watching. Not counting the current events around the world as we watch the Mideast, we watch over there. We Russia just promised the uh, World War III if U.S. supplies long-range missiles to Ukraine. Israel, if you've been following that, was attacked by Hamas. Lebanon, and, and we know Iran is behind it. Yesterday, Israel was able to use pagers uh, for Hezbollah, and um, they use those as weapons. And you've been watching the news at the last I read, there was 11 dead and 2,800 2, in, the, in the hospital. How did they get into, they, they're actually into the, got them into the pagers. Um, that was amazing to me to see that how, how they were able to do that. But anyway, you, you see those things. We, we watch even our own nation and its moral decay as it strays further and further away from God. So there are indeed many things to worry about in this world. But I, I know that if, if you want to stay safe, there's not a whole lot. I mean, if we're going to stay safe and secure and not worry about stuff, well, I know that every 24 seconds, one person dies in a road accident. So we need to stay away from automobiles. We need to stay away from home because 17% of all accidents occur in the home. We, we need to stop walking because 14% of all accidents occur to pedestrians. No more plane rides, train rides, or boats because 60% of all accidents involve them. 32% of all deaths occur in hospitals. So whatever you do, stay out of the hospital. People are dying there. Listen, worry is a choice. We choose to worry because it comes from up here. It comes from our mind. And, and you know, we have plenty to worry about. Plenty of things to consume our minds. But what good does worrying do for us anyway? What one man said, there is no sense in making mountains out of molehills as all it does is exhaust the mole. That's what we do many times. We build mountains out of little hills. Sometimes that's all we do is worry and it consumes our thoughts. But what are the odds of those worries actually coming to pass? The, the, the older guys, there's a bunch of you guys that are, oh, I, no, I, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> So all, all of us that are a little older, right, you remember when Jaws came out, it, it, in 1975 it came out. People were worried. They were afraid to go into the water. I didn't take a bath for a month. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> but the reality is this. The odds of being killed by a shark are one in 350 million. The odds of dying in an earthquake are one in 11.2 million. The odds of being killed by lightning is 1 in 4.2 million. The odds of dying from a spider, lizard, or snake bite are 1 in 54 million. To see another uh, Cowboy Super Bowl is 1 in 5 million. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Especially this last weekend, the Saints. I'm just kidding. Don't get all hurt. You know I'm kidding, right? Uh, listen, I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. But you know what? They don't know me. I still have to pay for a baseball cap if I want one. If I want a Steeler jacket, I got to go pay 150 bucks, you know? I have to pay for my own Steeler pajamas. No, I'm just kidding. I don't wear, I don't wear Steeler pajamas. And for Super Bowl, I'll be sitting here in Los Lunas eating nachos. I won't be playing in the game. 
<clears throat> so you know what? It, it's, they'll get all hurt. There's a study at Penn State University. Researchers asked 29 people with general anxiety disorder to keep a journal of everything that worried them over a 10-day period. And only about 8% of the things that people worry about come true. So less than one in 10 things that you stress about is actually worth it. It's like the lady who worried all her life about dying of cancer and then got hit by a train. You know what I mean? You, you don't know what's coming. It, it seems that our world has filled our thoughts with worry. New articles, social media it is, is everywhere now. Everyone, everyone has it. Uh, they all have something to say that causes us to worry about stuff. You know, it bums me out. Even food. You can't even eat food happy no more. They say, eat this, it's good for you, but then they say, don't eat it, it's not good for you. Don't eat this, it causes laboratory mice to have gas, you know? <laughs> you know, and, and then they tell you, drink disgusting kale smoothies. No, don't, you'll throw up, don't drink those. Go on the Atkins diet, you've heard that. No, go on the South Beach diet. No, go on the keto diet. Eat eggs, no, don't eat eggs, eat just the whites. No, eat the yolks, no, eat both. Before you know it, you don't even know what to do. You know what's happening with, with our uh, society? We, we lose weight, and then we gain weight, then we lose weight. We inflate like that, that fish in the sea, that one in the ocean, that bloat fish. That's what happens to us. Even our airbags have been questioned at times. They, we're told, be careful, airbags are dangerous, right? Because they go off, but they also protect you. So we have so many worries and fears that we've even come up with lists like arachnophobia, fear of spiders, claustrophobia, uh, uh, fear of small places. They're over, I looked at the list to check it out to see where we're at now. It, on the phobia website list, uh, as of December 2023, we're already f over 550 phobias that we've created according to the Science of People website. So what, what that tells me is we think too much, we worry too much, we let stuff consume our minds, Worry, worry, worry. It overwhelms us at times, and it preoccupies our thoughts. And, and you know the reality is this. It's hard to find a headstone with this inscription, died from worry, yet doctors tell us that illness has come from worry, from anxiety, and from fear. A survey was done of the top worries in October 2023, which is what, 10 months ago or so, 11 months ago? Uh, it was done by Chapman University this year. So the top five, wor five worries in the United States right now is the top one, number one, is corrupt government officials. The number two one is e economic financial collapse. Number three is Russia using nuclear weapons. And if you've been listening five days ago, they, they warned to use them. Uh, the fourth is the U.S. becoming involved in another world war. And the fifth one is people that we love becoming seriously ill. Those are the top five. On a personal level, then we worry over so many things. Finances, inflation, we know is out of control. Uh, and we, how are we going to make ends meet? I hear that a lot. Our health, our aches, our pains, stuff that we can't explain sometimes, especially in age as we get older. You know, that twitching eye that we got going, we don't even know why. And then we, it's only seven cups of coffee that you drank. That's why. So, so we worry about this stuff. You know what? We worry about our, our dysfunctional families, right? We all have those. Who, what are we going to do for, for Thanksgiving? You're going to invite Uncle Rujilio over? What are you going to do? Everyone has one of those guys. So a long introduction to a big problem. Worry can consume our minds and our thoughts and our heart. Some worry a little bit. Some worry sometimes. But some worry all the time. But what does scripture say about worry? Biblically, how, sh how should we live? If our life is based on trust and faith in God, how should we live? The definition of a Christian is one who walks by faith. If that be true, how should we live? Well, we're going to go to the Sermon on the Mount. And, and we're going to take uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. It says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, 
nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more, more than, uh, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So he says, don't worry. Don't be worrying about material needs, our food, our clothes. Isn't your life, church, more valuable than those things? The word worry that's used here, in the Greek, it means distracted. It means pulled away, pulled to the side, sidetracked. It means drawn into a different location. So what it does, it separates us from this camp to this camp. So what happens is we go from the camp of Jesus and his promises and standing strong there to the camp of worry where we forget all, all this camp here and we go to a different camp. You know, worry is, well, guy said it was like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. You just stay worrying. We, we have real issues in our lives, no doubt, and no one wears your shoes but you, no doubt. But the, the problem is, is that we can allow it to consume us. Jesus begins by saying, do not worry about food, about clothes, about what you're going to drink. Don't let the cares, of, in other words, don't let the cares of this world separate you from what's important. Look at verse 26. He said, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? So he uses an illustration of birds. He said, are, not, are we not more valuable than birds? We were created in the image of God. God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die in our place. He sent his son to die on the cross for us, to carry all of our sins there. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Indeed, we are important to him. So he, we are more important than the birds. He gives the birds, though, as an example of God's ability to provide. God provides for their needs each and every day. Now, notice they, they still work. They still look for worms. They still look for bugs. Uh, there is no free rides. For those who might say, well, he feeds the birds, so I'll just kick back and sit here. But, but Paul says, if, if any man will not work, neither he, should he eat, right? They're busy gathering food. They're busy building nests, caring for their young. We are certainly more valuable to God than the birds, so then, if God provides for their needs, for their needs, will he not provide for ours? Are we not of more value than the birds? And the other thing is, what does worry do for us anyway? If we begin to worry, look at verse 27. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? This verse speaks of the helplessness of man. In other words, what he's saying is we have no control. There's nothing we can do about the future. We can't stop the wheels of time. We can't stop the plan of God. Will we grow an inch by worrying? No. A, a cubit was actually 18 inches. If that was true, man, I tell you, I'd be seven, eight feet tall if that's true. In other words, what will worrying do for you, church? Will it help you? Will it change the outcome of the object of your worry? No. C.S. Lewis wrote, the future is something everyone reaches at the rate of 60 minutes an hour, whatever he does and whoever he is. See, the future comes either way. The future is coming one minute at a time, and there is no stopping it. And worrying won't help. It won't help you grow or change the future. Verse 28 says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So the question is, why do we let concern over physical needs distract us? We worry about our clothes. We worry about our everyday necessities. And these worries distract us once more from what's important in our lives. Some worry about the latest trends. I mean, they, they, they got to have it. They, they got to have those hey dudes. 
You know what those are? Their shoes. I didn't even know that. Me and Kat went to Cabela's because I, I earned points on my card. And I said, hey, man, I need a pair of shoes. Let's see. And I saw some shoes up there. I said, look at those. Little, those look light. So I put them on. I said, they feel pretty good. I came here to the church, and all I heard was, hey, dudes. Hey, dudes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Those are hey, dudes. What are hey, dudes? I had no clue what a hey, dude was. Apparently, it's like a famous shoe. But some people look for that kind of stuff. I got it by accident. I called my, hey, Bato. No, I'm just. <laughs> they are comfortable shoes, but I, I didn't know. I bought them by mistake. So some, some look for these types of things. They, they look for these names, you know. They, they, they want the hey dudes, and they want the, uh, that pair of skinny jeans for fat guys that you can find somewhere. <laughs> Or, or, you know, clothes from, what, what is that, H&M? That, that people get those, or Mike, Michael Coors, is that the first place? You know what I mean? Lord, Lord, I need the NFL jacket with a Super Bowl logo, you know, a recent one. You know, that one, that's hard to find. Some people not having those brands are real worries. But there, there shouldn't be a concern for what we wear, what, what we wear, right? We may not wear Nike shoes, but maybe we get the cheaper Mikey shoes. You know, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes, man. Either way, we shouldn't be worrying about our clothes, right? He said, consider the lilies. There's no gardener, yet he takes care of them. Solomon was visited by kings, yet in all his glory, he didn't compare to the lilies. With all his kingly attire, his robe, he didn't compare to their beauty. Yet the lilies don't toil nor spin, yet they grow and are beautiful. Verse 30. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So now he brings a comparison. Uh, Jesus asks, or, or he, he brings a point that the grass is temporary, right? It's, it's only seasonal. It's beautiful through the spring and the summer, yet it dies in the winter. Then the grass is burned and it exists no longer. So, so if he takes care of this seasonal grass, how much more you? Yet even Christians still worry. Even with these different subjects brought up here, people still worry. According to Barna, Christians under 35 were the most uh, worried about finances and their career. Baby boomers, that's, that's 1946 to, to 1964, if you were born in there, you're a baby boomer. You're worried about finances and health. If you're Christians, if, if you Christians are over 55 and older, you health factors were the top worry at, at a three to one uh, ratio. You know, you know what that means. When you get older, your perspective changes. You start seeing money as less important. Why? Because your body's getting old, right? Your teeth no longer sleep in the same bed with you. you, you it's, it's changing. Things are changing. What was that? What did they say? Your back goes out more than you do? That, that happens. And you know this. That one, I always say this. One, one day, somebody may be wearing my slippers, you know, or, or sitting in my favorite recliner. And you start realizing these things. You're like, man, I'm getting older. Stuff's happening I never knew. So, so Christians and even older Christians, they're, they're, they start worrying about many things. Jesus exhorted his disciples. He told them to lay up treasures in heaven. But we ask, well, what about our future here on earth? How will we provide food, clothing, shelter? How can we keep from worrying about these things? But the, the, the issue is this. We first have to get our priorities in order. God has to come first in our life. He has to be number one. But how can God be number one if all we do is worry about stuff? Do you remember the story of Martha? Always worrying. In Luke chapter 10, verse, 39, verse 38, it says, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. See, Martha had many things in her mind. And, and I, I, you know, how many of us could relate with that? Because many of us get like this. We're just like stuck with, with I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I gotta, uh, that's all we do. And we forget the things that are more important. We, we forget. It's all about our deadlines. It's all about the stuff we have to do. She even, notice, she even got upset with Mary, whom she saw just kicking back in her view. But she wasn't. Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. See, the truth was that Martha was distracted from sitting at Jesus' feet. She had been taken to another camp. She had been distracted. She had, been, she had given up the thing that was most important, hearing Jesus, sitting at his feet, listening to what he had to say, what he was going to speak into her heart. She gave that up in order to work, to do things. She lost, her priority was off. That can happen to us. You know what, it can happen to us, even attending church, even as Christians, not listening, not worshiping, not doing, we can do things and we can get caught up in the work that we're doing instead of actually sitting at his feet and saying, Lord, speak to my heart. See, she should have been at Jesus' feet, but she gave up his word. The rest of the stuff is only temporal, like getting the food ready. That's what she was worried about. You know, I got to feed all these people. She had a chance to listen to our father, to sit at his feet, but she gave it all up for things that were not the priority. And her mind, she was worrying about the whole thing. See, we can do that. We can give up hearing God's word. We can worry about stuff in exchange. I'm going, I'm going to clean my house today, or I got to do that. I got I to do this. Or I've got to visit my cousins or whatever. I got to work on my truck. I got to cut the weeds. I got to do this. And, and we all have this list that we can make for ourselves. And, and we don't have that same list when it says, you know what? I got I to gotta read God's word. I got to take some time to prayer. I, I got to seek him today. I got to cry out to him today. We, we, we tend to forget. The Bible tells us, don't forsake the assembling of the saints. Yet we seem to be able to find all kinds of excuses to not go to church. Now, I speak to the, to the choir here tonight. Or, but we, we, can, we can find ways to not engage with him, in, in whether it be in worship or a study of his word. Like Martha, we can say, I'm busy, Lord. I got things to do. Way too busy. But listen, we have 168 hours in a week, yet we, we find excuses to set aside one hour for him, or, or even two or three. Honestly, we need to set aside, uh, set aside time daily for him. Uh, just looking to him, looking to his word, not because it makes us righteous, but because he is righteous. And he died upon the cross for us. It's important because our whole future rests on the hope that he gives us, right? Because we believe with our whole heart that Jesus lives. Jesus then should be the number one priority in our life. But like Martha, many things can pull us away. Worrying about stuff that really sometimes is not really that important. So the question, are, would you, what would you say? Are you being distracted by worries tonight? Is something pulling you away? Is there issues or are you being just taken out? Are bills, illness, Family fighting, jobs, or are, is anything, relationships, are they distracting you? Listen, don't allow Satan to reign in your life by distracting you and taking you from this camp to this one. See, that's his goal. He wants to take your eyes, he wants to have you take your eyes off of Jesus. But we have to understand that Jesus loves us and he wants fellowship with us. Jesus uses a basic principle for us to understand. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, he said, He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for, all, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, he gave his son, his only son, do you not think he'll give you what you need? If this, then that. That's kind of what this principle is. If this, then how much more that? He also used an example of the Holy Spirit in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
How much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? You see, if we sinners can give good things to our child or our children or to those around us, how much more can God bless us? If he is powerful enough to create life, isn't he able enough then to provide food and clothing to sustain the life that he created? Of course he is. See, we don't ever want to live like the children of Israel, questioning God. You know, in Psalm 78, it looks at that, that uh, story in verse 18. It said, and they tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they did not believe in God and did not trust in his salvation. Yet he had commanded the clouds above and opened the doors of heaven. He had rained down manna on them to eat and given them of the bread of life. Men ate, ate, ate angels' food. He sent them food to the fool. He caused an east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he brought in the south wind. He also rained meat on them like the dust, feathered fowl like the sand of the seas, and he let them fall in the midst of their camp all around their dwellings. So they ate and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not deprived of their craving, but while their food was still in their mouths, the wrath of God came against them and slew the stoutest of them and struck down the choice men of Israel. In spite of this, they still sinned and did not believe in his wondrous works. Therefore, their days uh, he consumed in futility and their years in fear. That's heavy when you read that. When we as the children of God ask, can God, will God, is God able to, to help me? Is he able to sustain me? You know what? It's unbelief. Worry is unbelief. Yet when, you, when you think about what that means, it's, it's not believing. The Israelites didn't believe that God could do these things, and it angered God. He had done so much for them as he delivered them out of Egypt, yet they lacked the faith in his abilities to sustain them through the desert. He brought water from the rock, yet they doubted his ability to feed them. When we worry, we reveal within ourselves our own unbelief in God. The hypocrisy uh, was an issue dealt with many times by Jesus. You see, to be a believer and to worry, therefore, is a form of hypocrisy. How can a Christian have faith in God and then worry? We live by faith. We walk by faith. We trust God. The whole basis for Christianity is being justified by faith. We have to believe that Christ died on the cross for us. We have faith that his blood cleanses us. We believe that he's in control of all things. So to worry, can God, will God, is God able, is a lack of faith. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, as we continue. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So we're told two sparrows were sold for a copper coin. That's cheap. Yet God cares for them. He, we're, we're told not none of them fall to the ground without, without our father's knowledge. Now, he also mentioned, you know, some of us don't have much hair left, but those hairs are numbered. Two of them, if there's two of them, praise the Lord. Yet how often do we let worry consume us? I, I call it building scarecrows because I, I see it so much, and I do it. We, we, we do it one leg at a time, one hand at a time, and we stuff that scarecrow, and we build that little scarecrow monster that we're believing is going to take place. And we build it, and we worry, and we allow it to consume our mind sometimes. 
Like I said, the eye fluttering, and it just turns out to be all the coffee we're drinking. Or it could be anything. Anything that's happening can take us out if we allow it to. And you know what it does? You can't even sleep good at night because you're worrying about stuff. And then you get up in the morning, and the first thing you do is begin to worry again what you went to bed worrying about to begin with. And then you worry all day long, and it can consume your thoughts. When we worry, we take God's responsibilities out of his hands, and we place them into our own. See, we want to control all things, but we can't. In the, wor in the words of the great philosopher Nacho Libre, we don't have any ego powers, as he used to say. So if we can't change it, we can't control it, and we can't handle it, then why worry? Jesus said, look to the birds. Look to, to your height. He said, look to your life. And he said, remember the lilies. If God takes care of them, will he not care, take care of you? Were, were you not created in the image of God? You were designed to spend eternity with him. At the end of, of verse 30 in Matthew chapter 6, he said, you of little faith. So if we worry, we are of little faith. We have little faith in God's ability to help us or to intervene in our situation, whatever it is. No faith in his promise to care for us or faith in the power that he has to deliver us with that promise that he's made to us. So the question would be, could the Lord accuse us here tonight could he say, O oh, ye of little faith? I wonder how true that would be for many of us. Is there something that has been consuming our minds here tonight? Do you have worry going on in your life? Do you remember the story of the disciples going through the storm? In Luke chapter 8, verse 22, it happened on a certain day that he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us cross over to the other side of the lake, and they launched out. Listen, when Jesus makes a promise, he keeps it. If he, if he says you're going to go to the other side of the lake, you're going to get there. And so he told the disciples, let's cross over to the other side. And so they head out, headed out. But in Luke chapter 8, verse 23, next verse, but as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water. And they ceased, and there was a calm. But he said to them, Where is your faith? You know, the disciples were doing fine as they sailed until the storm hit. We do real well until the storm hits our life. And then notice they lost composure. The waves started kicking in into the boat. The boat was filling, we're told. They began to cry out like we do sometimes. They had gone into panic mode. But notice they go to Jesus. He's fast asleep. He's asleep. How did he sleep? Think of all the worries that might have kept Jesus awake. He could worry about the religious and the political leaders that were plotting against him. That was happening. He could have worried about his family. Remember, they thought he was crazy. He could have worried about the overwhelming crowds that had been following him and all their many needs and what he was going to do with them. He could have worried about the disciples that he chose, you know, he could worry about the future. Why? Because he knew the cross was up ahead. With all these things to worry about, Jesus wasn't worried. He slept on a rocking boat with waves splashing against the boat and even into the boat. I like what David Guzik writes. He said, the wind didn't wake him. The arguing of the disciples didn't wake him. And the water splashing over the boat didn't wake him. But at the cry of his disciples, he instantly awoke. Jesus is like the mother who sleeps through all kinds of racket 
but at the slightest noise from her little baby, she instantly awakes. You see, in, the time, in times of trouble, Jesus hears our cries. He knows we're hurting. He knows we're crying out. He knows what's happening in our lives. There are times that we cry, Lord, I, 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 I'm perishing. Lord, I can't handle the pain that I'm in. Lord, I can't handle the loneliness that I'm dealing with. Where are you, Lord? Speak to me. I can't do it alone. But the whole time that we cry out, Jesus is in the boat. He never left us. We're told that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. When Jesus fed the 5,000, they doubted the Lord's ability to do so. Remember what happened. They reasoned among themselves. It's too much for Jesus. I don't know how he's going to do that. Remember, they were, they were ready to go buy stuff. You, you know, the greatest hindrances to our faith sometimes is our reasoning. We begin to reason stuff away. We can find ourselves living out entire scenarios, worrying daily because we're reasoning about stuff, worrying about the things that we build in our head, and we have no shortages of them right now to worry about. There's so many. And I said, from food, eating foods to nuclear war, we have plenty. Jesus said to his disciples, O ye of little faith. Remember Peter when he stepped out of the boat? He didn't worry about the depth of the sea. He didn't worry about the fact that water wouldn't hold him up. He walked on the water. But then he began to reason within himself. This doesn't make sense. I can't walk on water. He was distracted took his eyes off of Jesus, and he sunk. We reason that God can't do it, and we sink into life's depths as well. O ye of little faith, look to the birds, look to your height, look to the lilies, and trust God. And look at verse 31, Matthew 6. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. So Jesus tells us not to worry in verse 31 about the necessities of life. And then he tells us why in verse 32. He said people without God, the Gentiles, worry about these things. But we, Christian, have God as our heavenly Father and he knows all our needs before we even ask. He knows. Matthew 6, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, seek first the kingdom of God. Make him number one in your life. How do you do this? Well, you look to him. You serve him. You don't focus on material things. Let us lay up treasures in heaven, and he will provide our needs. Let us make God the priority in our life, because he is certainly able and he is certainly willing to do so. Look at verse 34. He said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know what, it's, what that says? It says, we got enough problems today to think about stuff. Worrying about tomorrow does nothing for today or for tomorrow. Corey Ten Boom is a believer who spent years in a Nazi concentration camp. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with her. She went through more heartache and more trials than most of us will ever go through in our lifetime. And she said this, worry does not empty tomorrow of sorrows, it empties today of strength. So if we know it's foolish to worry, why do we do it at all? Because even with the grace of God in our life, we find it hard to totally depend upon him. That's the bottom line. But church, we have no control over the future. Worrying about the future only distract us, distracts us from the duties of today. So let tomorrow take care of itself and you, Christian, trust in God. Make his kingdom the number one priority in your life. Forget about the material possessions. Forget about the issues that are troubling you. What, what if we would put all our energy 
into his service instead of worry. If we put all our energy into prayer, into fasting, into witnessing, let us improve everything we can about our life today while we can. You know, I entitled this message, Worrying About Worrying. Because some of us are worry warts. That's what we do. We even worry about worrying. That's all I do is worry. I got to stop worrying. No matter what storms of life may come our way, whether they're employment problems, shelter, food, health, family life, remember that our treasure is in heaven, not here. We're only passing through. We're, we're simply pilgrims in a strange place. And our Father will provide for us during our time on earth. Let him do it. Or we can go through life on earth without God's help and worry about everything. The way we see things has to change. That's how you win this. The perspective that we have has to change. Because we cannot produce an inner life with God if we're constantly focusing on the outward life and, and everything that's happening out here. That's why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and he will take care of the rest. Remember, as Christians, we are justified by faith. Therefore, we walk by faith and know that the trials that we face will bring strength in our lives. And when we do face those trials in our life, know that God will never leave us. He never promised to take you away from the trial, but he promised to be with you through that trial. He will be with you there to strengthen you. And remember that worry is a choice. It's a choice. We choose to allow worry to consume us. And I just want to end with a quote. One man said this, every evening, turn your worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we, we don't have to carry the worries with us all over, everywhere we go. But we could instead leave them at your throne, and we know you are up all night. Father, we, we pray in our weakness. Father, we, we cry out to you. Oh, Lord, and we pray. I, I pray for this group here tonight. I don't know everyone, Lord. But I, but I know that, no doubt, we can all use uh, that you would fill us afresh tonight with your spirit. Strengthen us here tonight, each, each and every one of us, Lord. We lay our lives before you. And Father, I, I pray that you would go before us as we go forward in our families, in our workplace, wherever we're at, Lord, that you would use us in a great way, that we would become vessels used by you. And that in our weaknesses, Lord, that we would always cry out to you, that you would strengthen us once more. Father, we give you thanks and praise tonight, Lord, that you are faithful, and that you are near us and by us at all times. Father, go before us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when we're done here tonight, there's going to be a prayer team up in the front. If, if you're here and you need prayer for some reason, maybe, maybe you're here and you've never surrendered your life to Christ. Know that God loves you. It doesn't matter where you've been and what you've done. You can know, and you don't have to worry anymore. You can know that you're saved, that you're born again. And you can leave this place knowing that one day you will stand with God in, and you will be in his presence. You can do that. There'll be a team up here. Come on up here, and they will pray with you if you need that. They, they'll be here. I encourage you to do so. If I could have everybody stand, I'm going to share Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's our prayer from us uh, here at New Harvest, that uh, the Lord indeed would shine upon you be gracious to you. And uh, I pray that you have a great week. Uh, I pray for those of us that are going. Pray for us all that are leaving to, to Las Cruces. And, uh, and if not, we'll see you Sunday when we get back. Remember, there's desserts out there. There's, there's coffee and uh, there's cakes and stuff. Uh, meet somebody new. Have some fellowship. And may God bless. Because you are good. You're good. Oh, you are 